Welcome to Excel 2010 Statistics video number 82. Hey, if you want to download this workbook, Business 210 Chapter 9, second file, click on the link below the video. Hey, uh, so far in Chapter 9, we've been doing hypothesis testing when sigma is known, and we've been using the z distribution. Now we want to see what happens when sigma is not known, and we're going to use the t distribution. Here's our first example. We're on the HT uh, hypothesis test T distribution upper sheet. All right, fuses are us, manufacturers fuses. A new machine for manufacturing fuses was installed. The old machine produced 250 fuses per hour. The manufacturer wants to determine if the new machine makes more than 250 fuses per hour. In essence, does the machine do better, right? than the old one. Over the last month, a random sample of number of fuses made per hour. That's actually per. So we're, we're looking at an hourly rate. Was taken at the 0 0.01 level of significance. Can we conclude that the new machine produces more than 250 fuses per hour? Now, we have to consider for the T distribution whether uh, or not, we can actually use that distribution. Over here on the T histogram, here are guidelines. We talked about some of this in earlier chapters. When are we allowed to do the, use the T distribution? When the population distribution is normally distrib distributed or near normal, or n is sufficiently large, right? So if the distribution is normal, normal, then you can use sample sizes smaller than 30. If it's uh, not normal, n greater than or equal to 30 should be used. If it's skewed, then n equals 50. Now, originally when the t distributions were created, it was based on the assumption that distrib the population distribution was normally distributed. But uh, over the years, research has been done to show as long as n is big enough, then the predictions you make from the t distribution tend to be uh, pretty good. Now, you can run a histogram on your sample. It is absolutely not conclusive, but sometimes when you do not have data on the population, it may be the only uh, clue that you have. Now, let's go over here. This um, is for fuses, right? And here's, where is our sample? Our samples right here, and I actually ran a little histogram, right? And it kind of looks like uh, normally distributed, and I don't see any outliers. Now, for this example here, fuses, the manufacturer has been doing this a long time, and they know that the distribution for this type of situation is normally dis distributed. So because this is a new machine, there's no, no data on what the population standard deviation is. The population standard deviation for the manufacturing situations like this tend to be normally distributed. All right, so we're going to use our T. Now, just as before, when we're setting up hypothesis testing, it's helpful to think about what the point of view is, what you're considering, and what the goal is. So the point of view here is clearly the manufacturer wants to see if the new machine is more productive. What are we considering? The population of number of fuses made per hour for this machine. And our goal, run hypothesis test to provide statistical evidence to determine whether the new machine makes more than 250 fuses. Now, um, just as we did in the last four videos, we got to look at this point of view to figure out how to set up the hypothesis. Now, we're interested in more than 250. So the old trick is just do a more symbol. Is that more symbol pointing this direction? You betcha. So that means it's a test on the upper tail. Not only that, but if you know this symbol, you can just slap it on the alternative hypothesis. and so that's what we'll do. We have h sub a colon mu. Alternative hypothesis colon means here's the hypothesis. Mu is what? Space greater than. And we have 250. Now I'm going to come down here in step three. We list all of our variables and do our calculations. So the hypothesized mu will be 250. 
So I'm going to list that right here. And of course, as we've been talking about in many videos, once you know the comparative operator here, you simply flip it, space, less than, and add an equal sign. All right, so now we've set up our hypothesis, our alpha. That's our risk of making an error. What type of error? A type 1 error. In particular, alpha tells us the risk of rejecting our null hypothesis, even though it's true. All right, now let's go down and make some calculations. I'm going to scroll over just a bit here. So we have our hypothesized mean of 250. Sigma, we don't know it. It's not available. This is a new machine. We don't have any data on it. Our sample standard deviation, we'll use stdev.s. So we get 5.19. Uh, statistic to use, we are going to use ty because we don't know sigma. Sample size, we're going to use the count function because we're counting how many numbers there are. For t, we have to calculate our degrees of freedom. n minus the number of samples we took. So we get 4. Degrees of freedom is used by the t or to, de to determine which of the many t distributions you are going to use. The smaller the sample size, the more spread out and variation there is in the distribution t distribution. We'll take our sample mean. All right, so we get 255.2. Alpha. Our type of test, this is a one tail on the upper end, so that's on the right. Standard error. Now, we are going to use s instead of sigma. So we say our s divided by square root of our n. Occasionally in this class, students will make this uh, calculation incorrect because they're thinking, oh, we have to use degrees of freedom everywhere, but that's just to determine which distribution. Right? Still, for standard error, number of standard deviations for our sampling distribution of x bar, it's still square root of n in the denominator for this standard error calculation. Our test statistic, uh, same as we've been doing for the z distribution, we're going to take our sample mean minus our hypothesized mean and divide it by the standard error. All right, so now we have our test statistic. Now let's look at a picture here. I'm going to right click show this. There's our picture, right? We have a hurdle. Alpha equals uh, 0 0.01. Anything above the test statistic, if it's above here, we're going to reject the null and accept the alternative. Anything in this direction, we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. All right, so we have our test statistic. And that's going to determine, we ha um, you know, if it's on this side, fail to reject this side, reject. Now, we have two methods. So I'm going to scroll down here. We have the p-value and the critical value. So p-value will tell us the probability of getting that test statistic or greater. So we're going to use the t functions. Now, as always, even when we're using the z or the t, Functions calculate from negative infinity up to whatever point. So if I'm interested in the probability on the upper end, I'm going to calculate probability from here up to our test statistic, wherever it is, and then subtract that from 1. So equals 1 minus t dot. And just as we've been doing for the uh, norm dot s dot functions, dist gives us uh, we throw in a test statistic, and it gives us probability. And then the inverse will throw in a probability, and it will give us a uh, test statistic. All right? It says x, but what it wants is the test statistic, comma, degrees of freedom. I have my degrees of freedom right over here, so I'm going to click on that. Comma, and the cumulative means are we plotting a 
chart. No, we're not. That's fault. We're doing cumulative from negative infinity up to our test statistic. So we say 1. All right. Wow. Now that, we've done three or four examples so far. And that is the smallest p-value we have uh, calculated. This is 0 .00. If we rounded it, it would be 001. That means one in a thousand times we could get a uh, sample mean uh, this small and make an error, right? So this is extremely strong evidence uh, for us to reject the null hypothesis. Our rule, just as before, is p-value when it's less than or equal to the alpha. We reject the null and accept the uh, alternative. Our critical value rule. Just as there are, we used inverse functions before, we're going to use our t dot and then inverse. Negative infinity up to whatever uh, point on our chart. The t inverse, we're going to throw in probability alpha. And it will give us the t, st the t value that serves as our hurdle. We have alpha of 0 0.01. We want the uh, probability on the critical value on the upper end. So we have to say 1 minus. So in essence, we're putting 99% in here, right? And then comma, the degrees of freedom, tells us which amongst the many t distributions we're going to use to calculate this critical value. All right, so on the right, we have a hurdle of 2.62. We clearly can see this is way past. So in both with both rules, and these will always be the case, uh, they'll come to the same conclusion. Let's look at our picture. So here's our picture, 3.87. And again, the most uh, important thing here is this p-value is so small that uh, it provides extremely strong evidence that this new machine is faster. All right, so we did our calculating. Now, always important, we make our conclusion with the p-value. Uh, our p-value is less than our alpha, so we reject the null and accept the alternative. This is very strong evidence. With the critical value, critical value is passed, so it's bigger. I mean, sorry, our test, test, test statistic is bigger than our critical value, so we reject the null and accept the alternative. Again, that's. Uh, we want to say a little bit more than that. Succinctly said, the statistical evidence, I should put very, very strongly suggests that the new machine is more productive than the old machine. Said another way at alpha point, point zero 0.01. Yeah, we had a, a high, uh, a low alpha, which meant our hurdle for rejecting was much higher, but we're way past it. So at an alpha of 0 0.01, our sample mean of 255 fuses made per hour provides statistically significant evidence that the number of fuses made per hour is more than 250. And finally, we do have the chance of making an error. We do run a 1% risk of a type 1 error that we might say that the mean number of fuses is more than 250 when in fact it does it is not. However, the p-value provides very strong evidence that this machine is more productive. OK, so that's our first example of t. When we come back, we'll have two more videos where we'll look at calculating t on the lower end and a two-tail t-test. All right, see you next video.